Welcome to Douglas Wilson's The Plodcast. This week in the current events section of The Plodcast, Doug makes clear the devastating news that education matters. As it turns out, Americans have been subsidizing the radicalization of its children in higher education for decades. As we look around and see private businesses on fire and bricks flying through windows, we see that the loaf has been plenty leavened with unbelief. So if you or someone you know has a recently graduated senior looking for an open campus this fall, without masks or riots, apply to New St. Andrews College at nsa.edu slash fall2020. Come to New St. Andrews College in person this fall and learn to inherit, appreciate, and critique your history like adults. Welcome to the podcast. This is episode 148. 148. Uh, it's very clear, looking at the evening news, that what we really need is a theology of rioting. Uh, well, actually, let me qualify that. We don't need a theology of rioting as though we are interested in rioting and we need to know how to do it theologically. We need a theology of rioting so that we can understand what's going on when people riot. What's going on when this sort of thing happens? What is their theological assumption? What do they think will come out of this? Um, Now, anybody with eyes in their head, anybody with common sense, anybody who understands how the free market works, understands that what comes out of this kind of destruction is destruction. When uh, you're creating, you burn out all the grocery stores, you're creating a food desert. You're creating a situation where people can't get drugs or food or uh, the staples of life, and the businesses aren't going to want to come back because the last time they were there, just a week and a half ago, you rioted and burned them all down. Uh, so we see that th- this devastation simply brings in devastation. But these people are without God, without hope in the world. What do they think they're doing? We don't have a theology of rioting because we don't have plan on rioting. But what is their theology of rioting? Now, I'm not saying that if you stopped 10 rioters on the street and said, what's your theology of rioting, this is the answer you would get from them. Uh, I'm explaining to you what's driving them on a primal level, uh, whether or not they can articulate it. Here is the fundamental pagan assumption, and and it uh, it has to be a pagan assumption if there is not a, if there is not a creator God. For Christians, God said, let there be light, and there was light. God spoke heaven and earth out of nothing. God created heaven and earth out of nothing. We believe in creatio ex nihilo, creation from nothing. The only eternal being is the triune God. The only eternal reality is the triune God. And so he spoke the heavens and earth into existence. Now, if you're an atheist, if you don't believe in God, if you've if if you're someone whose education has left God completely out of it, what is eternal? Something we're something's here. Here we are. We have to. We're existing. We have to de- account for ourselves. So something must be eternal. Something must be eternal. So you either believe in et- an eternal God, as the Christian does, or you believe in the eternity of energy and matter in some way, in some sort of form. Not only that, but if you believe there is no God, no overarching purpose, no uh, omnipre- uh, omniscient uh, designer who, who calls everything into its current shape, shapes it into its uh, current form, if that does not exist, then the whole thing is just shambling along, rumbling along, assembling itself as it goes. Now, what is, what is, that, um, what is that faith? Well, the fundamental pagan faith is that order arises out of chaos. Order arises out of chaos. You can see that in uh, Ovid's Metamorphoses, his uh, ancient book. In the beginning was 
uh, chaos. Uh, well, he's framing it not as an absolute, but yeah, there may have been chaos. And then out of chaos sprang the gods. So you have this chaotic condition, and out of chaos, the gods come. Well, the fundamental revolutionary faith, this, and this is why revolution is so pagan, so wicked, so wrongheaded. The fundamental pagan assumption is that order arises from chaos, and if we want to get a new order, we have to burn it down. So we, we burn the whole thing down, we bring in revolution, we level the place, and out of that chaotic um, set of conditions, order will spontaneously arrive, arise. Now, this is a faith position. <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's a radical faith position. It's, it's a religious commitment. You can see that it's a religious commitment because it's so contrary to the, uh, contrary to the evidence. You chase all the businesses out of Chicago, and then you're astonished that they don't want to come back. Uh, you, burned, you burned their uh, store down. Why would they come back? You didn't protect them. Why would they come back? Well, the discussions or the appeals to come back are not so much um, a negotiation attempt as they are an attempt to evangelize. So we want everybody to join with us in our faith that chaos will produce order. Now, the believer, the believer says that God, who is ultimate reason and light and order himself, spoke the universe into existence, and it's exquisitely designed and ordered because the divine orderer put it together. And we are to imitate him. We believe that order comes from order. Uh, the pagan believes that order comes from chaos. So, if it's the wrong order, if you don't like the order, if the order you're dealing with is chafing you or that you think there's injustice in it, then it's clear that we need a radical reboot. And the way you get a radical reboot is you um, burn the thing to the ground in the faith that order is going to arise. And, and you might say, well, I think that's kind of a far-fetched thesis. No, that's what the communists did. The, the 20th century that we just have barely escaped from is uh, a bloodbath of a century. And it's a bloodbath of a century because of this faith commitment. People believe that if they just got it to a state of chaos, if they just get it to this place, then, then a wonderful utopia is going to spring into existence. And you can see this in microcosm with the, the poor chumps in Seattle trying to make their little Chaz country go. Um, the f <laughs> it's hard to fathom that people with driver's licenses in the 21st century could gather in a place like that and think that what they were doing was actually going to work. It's not, that's, not, that's not order springing out of chaos. No, not even close. So, podcast 148, we come now to hamartiology. Our word this time around is, bear with me as I try to pronounce it, autokatakritos. Autokatakritos. <laughs> now, if we're to parse it out literally, this is a compound word. It would read something like, to bring judgment down on oneself. A shorter, uh, shorter version would be self-condemned. The word is used one time in the New Testament in its description of a false teacher or a heretic. Uh, and that one time is in Titus 3, 10 and 11. A man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition reject, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. Being condemned of himself. There's our word. Kritos is the, the word for judgment. Kata is down to come down on, and alta is self. So, uh, to bring it all down on yourself is, is uh, what the word, putting the word together uh, would mean. What we see here is not just sin and subversion, but sin that is in significant measure self-aware. In other words, the man who is propagating false doctrine knows himself that it is false, and he is persisting in his error for reasons of his own. In other words, some liars are self-deceived, and then because they're self-deceived, they go and deceive others. 
other liars know good and well that what they're saying is not true. The false teacher is doing what he's doing, saying what he's saying, teaching what he's teaching, because he has found that this is a good way, this particular line is a good way to get glory or gold or girls. So, the falsehood of what he is saying can be identified from his own premises. He's not consistent. He's just merely being willful. So, um, and this is why the scriptural response to such a man is simple rejection. It's useless to remonstrate with a man who is unwilling to listen to reason. So, if you, you, you uh, rebuke him, it says after the first admonition, after the second admonition, simply drop it. Simply drop it. Don't waste your breath. Save your breath for cooling your porridge. So we come now to the book review uh, section of our podcast, which is this is episode 148 of our of the podcast. Um, and the book review uh, is of a book that's not yet out, but it's going to be out shortly. Uh, it's called um, Sex and the Unreal City by Anthony Esselin. Sex and the Unreal City by Anthony Esselin. Now, I've uh, reviewed books by Esselin before. He's a Roman Catholic writer, um, one of the most insightful writers on uh, the perversions that are going on in our society today that you can find anywhere. He's written a wonderful defense of marriage. He's, um, he's, he's, just, a, he's just a great writer. So, Sex in the Unreal City. The thing that Esalen is arguing for here, and, he, sh- and he, um, he comes at this from a number of different angles, but basically we're, we have to distinguish between uh, sexual sin, which we've always had. Uh, in, this is a fallen world. People don't live up to their standards. People, uh, you know, that you've, we've always had people guilty of fornication. We've always had people um, uh, committing adultery. We've all, the reason that the prohibition of adultery is in the Ten Commandments, it was there for a reason. Uh, because if, if that prohibition were not there, then people would be committing adultery, and they commit adultery even with it there. But we have to make a distinction between sexual sin or a sexual falling short and sexual insanity or sexual apostasy, a complete uh, falling apart. So, um, let's say you've got a man, a single. We'll make him a single man, a bachelor, who is a Christian who wants to walk with God, and every eighteen months he falls into the sin of pornography. He looks at porn. Okay, that is a that's a sexual sin. That's a sexual falling short. Um, if that man concluded that he was actually a girl, or he said, I now identify as a six-year-old girl or a Chinese six-year-old girl, we're not talking about a falling short. We're not talking about not making the standard. We're talking about someone who's lost his grip entirely. So saying uh, for a man to say, I'm a girl, is on the same level as saying, I'm a poached egg. I'm Napoleon Bonaparte. Uh, that's now. Is it a sin to walk up to somebody at the bus stop and tell them that you're Napoleon Bonaparte? Yes, it's a sin, but it's also something else. When you walk up to someone at the bus stop and tell them that you're Napoleon Bonaparte, they don't call a pastor to come help you w- with this sin that you're committing. They call someone who will um, tie your arms around your waist and and take you off, take you away. Now, what Esalen is arguing is that we have fallen into uh, a sexual insanity in our generation, in our time, and most of our most of our functionaries, most of the people running the show, are not participating in this insanity, but are rather craven. They're cowards. So the lunatics have gotten control of the asylum. And there are a bunch of nurses and doctors who know that they're the crazy ones, and yet they're doing what they're told because they don't want to get shot, don't want to get beat up, and so on. So 
uh, we have gotten to a point, we've gotten to a point in our national frenzy where this uh, unreality, Esalen's addressing sex in the unreal city, this unreality, this detachment from the way things actually are is um, the accepted wisdom. And people who don't believe it at all go along with it because they don't want to lose their position. They've got a mortgage. They've got, they've got to get their kid through college. They've got, they've got reasons for going along. And they will discipline the, the, the people who are saying, wait a minute, that's not true. Uh, they will discipline them. But let, let's say, um, and I think Eslin would agree with this, if someone hit a breaker somewhere and all the crazy went away, all the people, all the people who were invested in the unreality, all the people who really believed in the insanity, if they all were gone suddenly, I believe that a bunch of the people who are enforcing their will would default back to factory settings. They just go back to normal or their own sinful normal. They would they would walk away from the insanity. I don't I don't think the whole world has gone insane. I think about five percent of the world has gone insane and they've been very, very loud. And a bunch of the rest of the world not participating in that insanity is simply uh, cowardly. So if you want a bracing good read on this, uh, on this subject, if you want someone to slap you a couple times and say, wake up, wake up, it's not what, what they're saying is not true at all. Not only is it not true, not only is it sinful, not only is it falling short, but they're trying to draw square uh, circles for you. It's, it doesn't exist. It's not real. It's not true. Sex in the Unreal City by Anthony Esselin. Mm-hmm.